Radio people. I've uh, made a start on the QRP Labs 10 Watt HF linear, as very much promised. Um, I've downloaded and printed out the instructions for assembly of this kit. Very comprehensive, 35 pages or so, I believe. Yeah, 35 pages of instructions. Um, my bag of bits is now uh, a kind of pot of bits. Um, very good quality PCB, as is always the case with these QRP Labs kits. They're not junk by any means. They're extremely good quality kits. Uh, lovely PCB. So looking at the instructions, um, the first and probably the most tricky bit of this is going to be winding all of the inductors. So what I propose to do is to show you the each inductor as it's made. Um, if there's anything particularly tricky uh, going on, I'll make sure I film that in detail. But I'll take a a dive back into the video uh, from time to time through the build of this uh, of this amplifier and we'll see how we get on. The, um, the first inductor is T201. It uses some of these tiny little binoclear, so there's two holes in the core. Um, when you use these cores, a turn is up and back, so you go through both holes to create one turn. So the first thing it talks about doing is actually making sure there's no sharp edges and it asks you to put a Put a drill bit in the end of the thing so we'll try doing this just to see how we get on with it um so I'll just make sure there aren't any sharp edges for the uh for the wire to get snagged on now the kit obviously came supplied with plenty of um enamel copper wire but i'm going to try and use my own i've got tons and tons and tons of this stuff so in this particular case we're going to do four turns of this binocular core so that's one and then we're going to go back up and back down again. So that's two. We're going to go back up and back down again. So even I can figure out that's three. And one more back up. and back down again so that's four turns so that's what this inductor looks like it's four turns on this binocular core hopefully that'll drop into focus at some point soon uh, it's very difficult to to see these little tiny things but they're ever so small uh, but hopefully you can see the uh, inductor wang now um, and that's uh, t201 so i'm going to go and solder that on the board and then we'll uh, we'll move on to the next one. I'll catch up with you in a few minutes. So dropping back in almost straight away, just to correct myself, I called it T201. It's L201 is the first component. Um, so you saw me wind it. Now I've I've installed it on the board. The um, inductor sits uh, fairly close to the circuit board, and then on the back I've just soldered it. I'll check the continuity with a meter to make sure the enamel has come off the wire and we've got a good electrical connection. Clearly I'm sure you appreciate electrically that should be a short circuit now between those two soldered pins. So I'll check that before I move on. And then the second component is indeed T201. So we'll do that one in a minute. So T201 uh, has a primary of six turns and a secondary of three turns, but the three turns is a bifiller wire. Um, they're very small and very thin, so I've actually taken some mines. This is 36 SWG, and I think there's about 40 kilometers of it here. Um, I've taken two reasonably good lengths of this stuff, and I've stuck it in my drill bit um, and the other end in a hook. So two lengths, um, one against a hook on the shelf over there, and the other in the chuck of the drill. And I've wound some quite tightly wound, bifiller wound, uh, wire here. So as I said, this is 36 SWG. It's very difficult to show you. It's so thin. Um, so three turns on the core uh, looks pretty much like that. The um, the inductor seems to be fairly intact. Uh, I've got the three turns in without too much difficulty. Um, so what I'm going to do now is try and get six turns as the primary in there as well. There doesn't look to be much room, but I'll have a go at that and then report back how I get on. So the six turn primary is now done as well. Um, this really is tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. Uh, I've had to use this geeky 
loop thing to make sure I can see it properly. Um, I know how attractive it makes me to women, so you don't need to comment on that. But the um, the inductor's done, so I've got a uh, three turns by filler uh, primary secondary and a six turn uh, primary, uh, all tiny, tiny little wires. So I'll now sort out which wire goes where and solder it onto the board. That's quite tricky, but not impossible. So T201 is complete. Um, with the help of a pair of tweezers, I managed to identify the different wires and feed them through the board. Um, again, quite difficult to show you, but um, so the bifiller and single turn primary is in there now. Um, what I've done, I used um, my bench multimeter to just confirm that the windings were as we expect them to be. I can't show you that because it's lower than the camera, but I've checked that the windings are right. I'm confident I've got the primary and secondary right. So that's T201 installed. Um, time to move on. So here's where I'm at with the build. Uh, I did a bit more last night. It's a nice bright morning, so we'll do a bit more today. Um, this on the right here is T204. This is the last inductor that it tells you to wind. This has got uh, two turns primary, which I've done with a gold wire, and three turns secondary, which I've done with a red wire to stop myself being stupid enough to mix them up. So the, the primary goes from this side, is wound from this side. So one, two, three, to, sorry, two turns of gold from this side. And then the red is three turns from the other side. So it goes one, two, three from this side. So the red is here and the gold is here. This one here is T203. This is 10 turns bifiller on a T5043. I already got some bifiller wound wire from when we built the Bitex a while ago, so I just used that. And again, I've got two different colors. You'll see that they're not quite the same thickness, but it really doesn't matter. Um, and one winding goes from this point here to this point here, and the other winding goes from this point here to this point here. So they kind of cross as you solder them into the board. It's important that you get them the right way around. There's three capacitors installed. This one goes in before T204, because obviously this is a bit in the way once it's uh, once it's in place. And then these two, I think, are 105, so I think they're one microfarad, or I, I don't know. They're 105, yeah, they're one microfarad ceramic capacitors. They're non-polarized one microfarad capacitors. So these go in next. And then the rest of them, I think, are point ones. These are the other three inductors that we've wound. This is the one that we wound together. Um, this is the these are probably the hardest inductors that you've got to wind all I'll say is follow the instructions the instructions are excellent there's some really good information about how you can use a DMM to check the windings are right so just take your time follow the instructions and and you should be all right there's nothing too tricky about it it's quite possible I found using a cocktail stick quite useful to push some of the wires out the way when I'm trying to get the six turns in on top of the bifiller winding, because it's really quite tight, but it's clearly quite possible. So I'm gonna move on now. Um, this is the best photo I could manage. Uh, it's quite difficult to get the focus right on this, but I'll press on now and catch up with you later. So the board's pretty much complete. Um, I've checked, double checked and triple checked all my soldering um, and I'm fairly happy with it. The, um, the next stage is to mount the IRF 510s. Now I've mounted them on the heatsink directly. Um, I've bent the legs back at 90 degrees from the body of the transistor, or the MOSFET I should say. Now. When I build it proper, I'll put some heatsink compound in here, but the back panel of whatever I'm going to mount this in needs to go between the, the heatsink and the transistor, so I'm going to leave it like that for now. The other thing we've got, we've got three um, BS-170s lying flat on the board here, and there's a, an M6 nut uh, that acts as a spacer that actually sits on the heatsink around there. Um, and you, you put this little uh, assembly together with a, a nut, a washer, and a cut-up um, heat 
shield type uh, washer. Um, this fits through the hole in the board that's here, like so. Um, this piece then fits on the back, very much like so. And then the whole thing should jiggle, jiggle, wiggle, wiggle, should fit together like that. And that screw should tighten up on here and hold the whole thing together like that. So I'm going to solder this up and then I think we can apply some power um, and see if it works. So welcome back to my worst nightmare. So yesterday I finished the amplifier, put it all together, applied the power supply, put a, a current meter in series uh, with the power supply. And the procedure says you have to adjust these bias pots. There's one here for this MOSFET, there's one here for this MOSFET. What you're basically doing is altering the voltage on the gate and monitoring the current drain to set the bias current. So the, the procedure says to set 125 milliamps for each of the two MOSFETs one at a time. Went through that process, no problem. That all worked beautifully. I then applied some RF here and there was diddly squat nothing at the output, which was quite a surprise to me. So I started poking around with my oscilloscope. Now this input transformer takes the input signal and basically splits it into two signals of half the amplitude and out of phase with each other. So at the gate of these two BS170s, we should see the input signal at half its amplitude, one out of phase with the other. And indeed we did. So that was working great. So I knew T201 was doing what it should do. But at the, uh, the drains of the uh, MOSFETs, of the BS-170s, at the drain, so here and here, I'd got no RF. I'd got my 12 volts coming in, or in my case 13.763, but I'd got my supply voltage visible here, because this is clearly a DC short, but not to RF. But I hadn't got any RF signal here at all, so I instantly concluded that my T202 must be a load of dingo's kidneys and I'd got the wrong windings or I got it upside down or I'd got it whatever. So I took that out of the board which was an incredibly painful process. I used um, lots and lots of uh, solder wick, uh, lots and lots of swearing um, and eventually I got it out. I then cut the windings off it and remade it completely. Put a new put a new one back in the board which was really fiddly with all the other components around it went through the same process again and the symptoms were identical so i hadn't fixed anything and i clearly didn't need to go through that pain uh, because it hasn't made any difference whatsoever so what i did then was start to poke around up on this part of the circuit up here so because the first thing i'd noticed was that the voltage at the gates of my bs 170s here so q203 and Q204. I was only measuring 1.5 volts and that seemed quite low to me. From experience I was kind of expecting that to be between 2 and 3 volts. So I'm poking around up here, now I don't really understand this circuit fully. I mean I can see what it's doing but I don't know why it's been chosen to be done this way. Now Hans Summers is an incredibly clever guy. All hail Hans Summers. Uh, but why this is designed like this I don't know. I'm sure there's a good reason. But anyway, so I followed my voltages through and on this side of the 2.2k resistor, so to the right hand side of R205, I'd only got about 2.1 volts or something, let me see what it was, it was 2.2 volts, yeah. And at this point here, I got 1.51. The 2.2k resistor was correct, I then went through actually and checked every single resistor, colour codes, values, made sure I got the right resistors in the right place. and. The only conclusion I could draw was that this BS170 wasn't doing what it should. So I took that out, replaced it with a stock component that I'd got here, and lo and behold, my 1.51 volts is now 2.73. With 2.73 volts on the gate, I can see RF at the drains of this, um, at the drains of Q203 and 204, and I can trace it all the way through to the gates of the MOSFETs. So this is looking much, much better and I'm ready to try the uh, try the test again, but very very painful. And um, getting that inductor out was really really difficult, and uh, I don't recommend it at all. But well, let's move on. So let's just walk through the uh, the procedure um, quickly. I'm going to apply power to the board now. 
Um, you're kind of lucky enough to be looking down my scope probe here, which is kind of interesting. Uh, hopefully you can see the board and you can see my current meter. So that's the idle current without any bias pots adjusted at all. Both bias pots are fully anti-clockwise. So what I'm going to do, the procedure calls for adding 125 milliamps to each one. So as we slowly increase this, it comes on all of a sudden. So if we're at 41, we're now looking for 125 above that. So that's 166 milliamps or thereabouts. So it's very, very, very touchy to adjust. So I'm going to stick with 164. Another 125 would be 260, 280, 290 milliamps. So let's try and aim for 290 milliamps with this other pot. So that's about there. So what I'm going to do now is couple up the RF and uh, my scope is looking at the output. So that's a very small input signal, about 6 dBm and I've got 30 volts peak to peak out. So what we can do now is take some fairly accurate voltage measurements, calculate the gain, but I suspect we're pretty much done now until we're ready to put it in a box. So I've taken some very basic measurements. Um, Peak to peak input, I measured at the amplifier just using my scope, uh, 2.5 volts peak to peak. That's an RMS voltage of about 0.88, uh, which is 11 or 12 dBm or thereabouts. And then the output was 45 volts peak to peak, which is around 37 dBm. So I'm calculating a gain of around 25 dB, which is pretty much on the money. <clears throat> so this seems to be working quite nicely now. Fairly quick conclusions for me. I mean, the kit is brilliantly produced. The uh, parts were all there. The circuit board is top quality. The instructions are exceptional. I think I was extremely unlucky to either break, melt, sit on, or do whatever I did to that BS170 that didn't work. I really think I was unlucky there. So I can't criticize the kit for that at all. It's a superb bit of kit, and I think it cost me $26, so you really can't fault it. So next time I've ordered a box, I'll, I'll get the box up together we'll get the touch screen, we'll finish off the low pass filters, we'll get it all in a box, build a power supply and get it all up and running um, and then that'll be the end of the project. As ever if you like what I'm doing please subscribe to the channel, I'd very much appreciate your support. I'll see you next time.